Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. Thank you guys for coming out today. Um, this morning, we're going to be doing a basic intro introduction to extrication. Uh, we're going to be dealing with um, some basic principles of extrication, just trying to cover how we're going to approach an extrication um, and then going to a door pop and a windshield uh, removal. Um, but first and foremost, um, why are we here? Uh, Hopefully it's going to be a refresher and it's an opportunity for us to train on our tools. Uh, the ladders out here, you guys have extrication equipment. Uh, you guys will be using your extrication equipment on the fire ground. As my team will be using the hydraulics off of the heavy. Uh, again, it's an opportunity for us to again train with our, with our tools. Um, the goal of what we're trying to do is trying to get everybody here trained together is that we want everyone to kind of be on the same page. We want to try to create uh, some uniformity, a standard approach uh, to how we approach all our extrications. Uh, we all have the same kind of benchmarks and priorities when we, when we show up on an extrication call. Uh, and we want to make sure that we try to create some kind of standard like that. So no matter who shows up on, on scene, whether it's the hazmat team, an engine company, a ladder company, or even a rescue company, um, that we're all going to kind of have the same priorities and the same um, uh, benchmarks that we're going to try to hit as far as sizing up our scene. Uh, so that when other units show up on scene as the evolution may progress, uh, it can basically be just a seamless integration uh, and just kind of the other people can show up, they already know where you guys are at and they can obviously integrate into the team and just keep a smooth operation going forward. Um, just like as responding to a, a fire scene, uh, that initial size up, those first few minutes where you're giving the, the size up to everybody and setting everything up and setting all the wheels in motion, if you have a good size up and a good first few minutes as far as setting up the whole scene or scenario, the rest of the call is going to go really smooth. So uh, that's kind of again what, what we're trying to really emphasize here today is getting all of us working together, all of us training together, and, and really kind of set up a standardized approach to how we're going to uh, tackle these extrications. Um, just some basic safety things that we're going to have uh, on every extrication, things that we should have in place that can protect ourselves and hopefully protect people on scene. Uh, we need to have a charged hose line in place every time we're using our hydraulic tools. Um, also, we want to have a dry cam extinguisher nearby. Again, it's quick and easy to deploy while we're taking the time for the uh, hose line to get put in place. We can obviously quickly grab a dry cam off an engine company and put that in place or even the rescue. Uh, just some terminology uh, that we're going to be using uh, on a call and out, potentially out there taking on the training ground. Uh, we get a term freeze. That means to stop exactly what you're doing. Essentially, we're all safety officers out there. And if we're, we see something uh, either happening or about to happen, and you need to get someone's attention. Sometimes yelling stop or no or whatever, and all the commotion, it gets lost. So when you hear that word freeze, everything stops, everyone freezes, and we obviously address whatever the safety concern or whatever the issue is that someone absolutely saw. Uh, this code real actually was uh, something that was new to me that I just learned about. Uh, I guess in these training scenarios, sometimes you know we have victims and people get moulage, and we don't know if this victim is part of the scenario or not. So people would say code real, so that hey, we know this is not this is not part of the drill. This is something that uh, needs to be addressed. Someone's injured, or there's an issue that we need to address. So that's something that was new for me. Um, other some safety concerns is just basic tool operation, which we'll talk about out there. Uh, you know, mainly just like obviously how to use the tool, not positioning yourself between the tool and the vehicle. Um, you know, we're obviously dealing with some you know pretty powerful forces and, and, and heavy metal and things like that, and we don't want to put ourselves in a bad situation uh, with the tool to work. And then obviously having our, pro our proper uh, turnout gear, our proper PPE uh, gloves. I believe everyone was issued uh, extrication gloves through the department, so now we all have those. Um, it gives you a little bit more dexterity as far as utilizing tools. It has a little bit more um, like puncture penetration on the back for like sharp edges from metal and glass and things like that. Um, also, very important whenever we're taking the windshield that we have uh, at least our hood at the minimum uh, covering our nose and our mouth because of those little shards of glass. Um, we're going to get to play with both our tools as far as I believe the ladders have the glass masters uh, and the heavy has uh, a rhino cutter, um, power, uh, basically scissors if you will, to cut the laminate glass, uh, but both of which create uh, a hazard as far as shards of glass. So we always want to make sure we have our respiratory protection. No. Um, so getting to our, our initial scene size up, um, and this is probably like a, uh, the most important part, I guess we're going to go into the door pop. And, and the windshield, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that as far as in here. Obviously, it's going to be more of a hands-on skill. Uh, this is something that we really want to drill home. This is obviously, if everyone, uh, again, does a good scene size up, uh, the rest of the evolution is going to go very smoothly. So, uh, some of our priorities, um, and again, 
as far as where these uh, things fall, as far as parties in or out of circle, uh, you can see there's definitely some overlap there. So don't get hung up. This is not like a steadfast thing like, hey, this has to be an inner circle guy, this has to be an outer circle guy. Things are dynamic. But again, just if you kind of have this as a general rule, it's going to help keep you uh, having a systematic approach so hopefully these, these benchmarks don't get missed. So with that in mind, uh, the inner circle, you're going to look at hazards, obviously in, under, and around the vehicle. Some examples, obviously, we're looking for leaking fuel. Uh, did it crash into a power line? We have any kind of electrical hazards that we're concerned about. Uh, potentially any additional victims, either in the vehicle, around the vehicle, or under the vehicle. Um, again, it's easy to get tunnel vision with all the, you know, the mess and the carnage and things like that that we want to make sure that we're addressing we don't miss any victims. Again, if you're approaching the, the, the car, you should have your hands, uh, that's your favorite thing, as you know, you should have any empty hands. You should have some cribbing and some tools in your hands, things like that. So as you're approaching the vehicle, you're doing your visual uh, 360 inner circle, you can also go ahead and start placing your cribbing and potentially take, start taking out some of that tempered glass, which are like your, your driver and side windows and rear windows. What we try to do as far as to make the sufficient, we don't want to walk past the job and leave it undone to have to go back and take care of something after the fact. So it just, it just becomes uh, a little bit more inefficient if we do that. So uh, typically your, your inner circle, this is probably one of the most important responsibilities again, as it comes to inner circle, is going to be your patient person. We need to try to get someone in the vehicle as quickly as possible. Again, obviously once we establish that it is safe to, go, to do so, and see what's going on with our patient. Our patient is really what dictates the tempo of any extrication call. Are they stable or are they unstable? And that needs to be communicated to command. Um, you know, real basic, you know, you're talking to them, they're talking to you, hey, you got a pain there with it, really got a pulse. You know, you, hey, you, if you have a radial, hey, you know, you got at least a good systolic of, you know, 80 or 90. So, just some real basic stuff, we can kind of do a quick assessment um, on our patient and find out if they're uh, stable or unstable. Secondary entrapment. This is a terminology which I'm sure is uh, possibly a review for many of you, um, but if not, just so you know, secondary entrapment has to deal with uh, the patient actually being pinned inside the vehicle. So, besides being trapped actually inside the vehicle, um, they actually might, may have the dash or brake pedals or some other kind of uh, intrusion uh, into the patient compartment that could cause it to be having a secondary entrapment. As the patient person, you quickly want to kind of take your hand and run it from their head down to their feet and assessing if you're feeling any kind of pinch points. Is there any kind of secondary entrapment? So again, we can kind of put that in our head as far as our inner and our, our size up. You know, what are going to be our, our plan as far as education? Not only do we have to get this door off, but now we're going to have to deal with maybe a potential a dash roll situation or some other kind of secondary entrapment. Soft and hard protection. Again, we're trying to keep our patient uh, safe. We're going to be using some very powerful hydraulic tools. We're going to be removing uh, sheet metal. Um, and it could be potentially intrusion into the patient part more so than that was already caused by the accident. So we do have a hard, short spine board that we use as our hard protection. And uh, to again, hopefully minimize that intrusion to the patient. And we have soft protection for all that glass that we're going to be taking, all those shards of glass that are going to be shattering everywhere. We want to go ahead and cover our patients so that they don't get any more cuts or any more injuries from the, from the shattering of the glass. As far as facilitating uh, the, the rest of the extrication, you're going to see a lot of these steps that we're doing in today in this inner outer circle may not have a direct impact as far as our evolution today with the door pop and the windshield where we're going to go. But again, those are the things that help facilitate the extrication as it may progress. So, peel and reveal, we were looking for hazards. Uh, there's a lot of plastic facades, as you guys know, inside these uh, interiors of these compartments. We have a lot of side uh, airbags and things like that. So we want to basically lo locate where those potential gas cylinders, things like that, we don't want to cut through that. We're, we're putting an A, B, or C post. Uh, also, uh, the nuts, the, the bolts uh, for the, uh, the seat belt tensioner is also something that we're going to try to avoid because it can do a lot of damage to our hydraulic tools. So peel and reveal basically is you're taking uh, you know a flathead screwdriver, uh, flathead screwdriver or any other tool to basically just kind of peel back that facade and see the see the metal and see where those so those hazards are so we know we can, where to cut. Uh, the good news is if you do it on one side, you don't necessarily have to do it on the other because everything is mirrored. So if you know where it is, you can advise the people on the outside where it is. If you can't get to it, great, but at least you got to do one uh, side at least for the peel and reveal. Moving on to the outer circle, again, you can see a lot of overlap, outer, uh, outer circle again, under, around the vehicle, same kind of uh, concern. Uh, again, also having, uh, you know, cribbing in your hand. Uh, we're going to talk about where to place them when we get outside, you know, just underneath the A post uh, and in front of the rear tires, typically. Again, when we go out into our scenario today, we're not doing the, uh, the zebra amongst the horses. Uh, we're basically doing for a vehicle that's on all four tires. Um, we're going to have access to pretty much whatever we want to do as far as our posts and things like that. So it's going to be a pretty straightforward evolution today. So um, you're going to be able to put the, the cribbing exactly where it needs to be. Uh, we'll talk about some other considerations with the cribbing when we get out there. 
uh, as, as far as if you're presenting something else than, than what we have today. This is a very in-depth uh, skill set and we're, we're, we're only going to a certain part right now because again, we really want to emphasize uh, that initial uh, phase of the extrication so that we hopefully are all on the same page. In addition to taking the tempered glass, something that's also very helpful with taking that uh, the windshield, eventually what we're going to do, uh, how about scoring the glass? A great tool for having your hands the halogen. Uh, you can take the fork end and basically just start punching along the A-post uh, and creating that purchase point so that we can get in there with our, either our glass master or our rhino cutters. And it's going to help facilitate that because either one of those tools, you've got to create a purchase point to get started when you're making your cuts on the windshield. So if you're walking around with your tool, your halogen, you can, just, you can score the windshield. If you don't have to do the whole side, just get it going a few, you know, a few inches so we have a nice good purchase point, a place to start when it comes to uh, taking the glass later on. Obviously uh, purchase points again, uh, you have the halogen, we'll talk about techniques you can use as far as where you're going, the A post, B post, C post, trying to create that opening for us to get our hydraulic tools in there. As you guys you know, probably are already aware, our hydraulic tools, especially our spreaders, are very bulky. Uh, and, and it seems to be the issue, even though we talk about door pops being very straightforward, uh, a lot of the issues that we run into um, is really trying to get a good bite before we actually go for the big spread uh, and we end up shearing a lot of our doors. So there's a little bit of finesse, a little bit of technique and stuff like that, which, which is why we train, we hopefully we, we get better at these skills. Um, and, and those are some of the uh, pitfalls we try to, try to avoid. Um, and the last, last but not least, as far as uh, outer circle things we want to take, take care of, is try to gain access to that hood compartment. Again, we're going to have uh, the vehicle we're looking at today has pretty much no front end damage, so we're, we should have access no problem. Uh, once you get access to the to the, um, to the hood, disabling that latch mechanism with your tool so that doesn't relatch on you have to deal with it again in the future. Obviously, we want to, the reason we want to gain access to the hood, uh, among other reasons, is basically to secure that battery because obviously, again, airbags is definitely a major concern for us and for the patient. So uh, we want to obviously secure our, our utilities, if you will, to control that battery and get under the hood. Uh, and then once now all our cribbing is in place, on all four uh, side, or both sides of the car, all four cribs are in place. We usually what we're going to do is we're going to take the tires and, and deflate them and let the, the chassis sit on our cribbing. The whole purpose of why we do that, again, we're trying to stabilize the vehicle. We want to get the vehicle off of its suspension because we want to minimize any kind of body roll while we're exerting these forces on the vehicle. So uh, once the, these two things are done, uh, Basically, we're going to go ahead and formulate our plan. We're going to go from least evasive to, you know, most of, more complex. Uh, and I use that like ELS before ALS kind of mantra, you know, for all us medics in here. <laughs> um, try before you pry. You walk up on extrication, we see a bad deal. Hey, is the door open? You know, we have, I know we're, this is an extrication class. We're going to have to go through all the process. But again, just don't lose sight of the common sense. Hey, which, the purpose of this whole extra thing is to get the person out of the vehicle as quickly as possible. Try the door. Uh, with reference to the secondary entrapment I talked about earlier, um, once we get into the access to the door, basically they have their, their knees or something are pinned underneath the dashboard. Does the seat move? Can we slide it back before we have to do a whole dash evolution? You know, again, just we're training because we want to have the skill set and these tools, but we can't lose sight of, of you know, again, just being doing the basics. Like, what is the purpose of the training? If we're trying to get the person out of the vehicle as efficiently and safely as possible. Uh, again, things have a tendency to work and not work, so it's always good when you're formulating your extrication plan, you have a plan A, a plan B, plan C, again, going from that least of to more complex. So in case plan A fails, you're already ready to go in plan B, and you can change gears and, and the operation keeps uh, moving forward. And then that's it, man, then just go to work, start and then execute your plan. Uh, again, the door pop, again, I'm going through this real quick, because again, it's just, you know, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, um, but the tools that we're gonna be using that today are uh, gonna be the spreaders and the cutters. Uh, having cable cutters are good because again, once you remove the door, there's sometimes like a lot of electrical wires running through the firewall into the door. Go ahead and cut and remove irons. Like I said, we talked about the halogen's a great useful tool, but you can also use a flathead axe as well. Uh, removing the door, like I mentioned earlier, having that purchase point um, and basically being able to. Uh, one of the actually um, reps from Hearst taught me this one: uh, spread with your tips in space. And basically, what that means is, as a general rule. If you can get the, the tips of the spreaders in deep enough to where they're no longer making contact with the metal, they're essentially they're in space, they're not touching anything, you'll have a good bite, and when you go to spread, you won't really shear the doorway. So again, you, as you know, you kind of your first time you get in there, you spread a little bit, you have to close it, you have to work it in a little bit deeper, open and close it, and then usually, uh, hopefully second or third time, you're, you have, you're in deep enough to where your tips are in space, you have a good bite on the door, and then you're ready to go for the, for the spread. That being said, um, 
These are all two-stage hydraulic tools. What that means, obviously, is uh, once you start going in the spread, you might meet some resistance. Stay on the throttle. Basically, the, 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 it'll build up pressure and it'll, it'll continue to spread. So if you let go of the throttle when you see it stop, you, you lose all that pressure that you're building up. So it's important that you stay on the throttle, let it build that pressure, and let it continue through the spread. Um, again, cutting the cable we talked about. And then once we have this big bulky door, we want to make sure we discard it in a safe location. Um, some of you may have, may have seen that video. There was something in there that I thought was actually a, a good visual reminder. Uh, paint the pavement. We basically put the, out, the exterior side of the vehicle door down to the ground. If there's by any chance any kind of uh, uh, airbag deployment in that door, later on it doesn't become a projectile. So if you put it face down, airbag goes off. I mean, I'm sure we've seen all those really funny videos of people putting their seats and they shoot up in the air. Uh, we don't want to have that happen with the door. We don't have we don't want to projectile on the scene. Um, so our, our disc our spoil pile usually get it out of the way. Nowhere near the operation. Paint the pavement. And then the last thing we're going to cover today is going to be removal of the windshield. Like I said, like I mentioned in the beginning, the PPE is very important. Talk about having a glass master versus the uh, the Rhino. Uh, I think for those of you who have a glass master, guess if you have not had a chance to play with the Rhino, you really appreciate it, and you probably get your hands on it today. Uh, and I guess we'll talk about now just a spoil pile, or with the windshield, you can even throw it underneath the vehicle. Um, the reason the the windshield is that is not necessary for a door pop, but again, it is something that we want to cover uh, as, a, as a kind of introductory skill. And like I mentioned before, things that we do out here today some may not be have a direct impact on what we're trying to do right now, but depending on how the evolution progresses, this is a step that needs to happen if we're gonna do a roof removal. So one less thing we have to go back and do later, we've already taken care of it in the beginning. Now hopefully, like in today, when we have a vehicle on all four tires, it simplifies that process greatly. But as we get into more complicated scenarios where a vehicle might be upside down or even on its side, stabilization is, is really key. It could be the crux of the whole operation. Um, but you know, as far as today's concern, we're starting off simple with just a vehicle on all four tires and you know from there we can grow. Uh, and then stabilizing the patient, like I said. If I'm on that first responding engine, uh, initially, I'm going to probably take command, obviously, and give a size up. But whenever the process actually starts, and we start working on the car, that's a whole lot to take in to be able to monitor the operation of the extrication as well as the entire scene. So me personally, I'm looking whenever Battalion 5 or Battalion 74 shows up to pass the command to them so they can see the bigger picture of everything that's going on. And then as the engine officer, I can focus then on just the operation of the extrication itself. <clears throat> we generally get into a habit uh, at Station 31 that that engine officer will then establish essentially the extrication group and be responsible for that process. And then usually one of the officers, Officer Rescue, is directly involved with the operation itself. In there with, uh, with the firefighters and drivers and or more hands-on, while that engine officer can take a couple steps back and just look and oversee the, the operation as a whole. Yeah, if I may, on that, just so you guys know, on an extrication, it's a little it's, it's a little bit more funky in the way that there's actually four levels of command, because, like I said in, in, in the classroom, the person, we got, we had to have patient contact. That person is running that call, okay? And, he, and then you have the officer that's on the tools, then you have the, the hazmat group or the extrication group supervisor that's out pretty much in the outer circle and then you'll get out to me or the captain that's also command so we have four levels and everything's got to move back and forth what i'm seeing out here and then what i'm remembering like hey give me an update on the patient what they're doing whether they've got a b and c the communication is so important but at the end of the day the person that's got patient contact is the one that's going to say it. If he says we got to go, then we got to go, and it's all hands on deck. You know what I mean? Otherwise, it gets run by the by the hazmat group, and then whoever's on the outside command takes care of the overall, just running the scene and giving time updates and just making sure everything gets checked. You know what I mean? But yeah, communication like that is very important. Um, now, if something happens in in District Five, and Engine 5, Platform 5, if you're able to get there, 
and get the scene stabilized, get the vehicle stabilized, and pop it. You don't need us. I mean, you know, we're, we're there to supplement you if something happens in your district or, in, you know, something in Ladder 45's district. So, you know, if there's anything that we can do to help you guys, you let us know. Or if there's just multiple patients, then give Rescue 31 a patient. You know, whatever the case may be or whoever that engine officer is, you know. Uh, so we're, we're just here to supplement each other and provide a better service. Um, now, you know, getting on scene, I can't stress how important it is to do a good size up and a good 360. Once again, identifying hazards and number of patients. That's not sometimes a very easy thing to do in a chaotic scene. But it's vital information right from the get-go because if we need to roll more resources, we need to get those resources going. It's no different than a fire. The first five minutes of fire are critical in getting everything set up and the resources rolling. Same thing with the, uh, an extrication. All right. So if we can start off in those first five minutes on the right foot, everything else after that should go smoothly. Okay. So good information, scene size up, number and location of patients, and you know what exactly? I mean, do they are they saying that no, I'm fine, I just can't get out, or do they look like are they unresponsive? Is this you know a, a more serious call? So all that information is vital. So these are just some of the things that if you're en route to a call, whether you guys are coming to supplement us in 31 zone or we're going to 5 zone, some things those responding units are going to be curious about knowing, uh, and particularly the, the battalion chief. Um, also, getting that vehicle stabilized and gaining access to the patient. And we're going to be working primarily with just some basic stabilization and the tools but just want to reemphasize how important it is to get some type of patient contact. Uh, everybody wants to do the cutting and, and do all that type of work, but it's, it's really important that once the vehicle is stabilized, can we get somebody into the car and further assess the status of that patient? Because like Chief Ladwig said, you know, that, that patient's really gonna set the tone for the entire, entire operation. And uh, that person obviously is going to be in full protective gear, but you can gain access. Put them through a window once it's stabilized because they, they have a lot of roles in that job. One, patient contact. If they're, if they're conscious and alert, they're going to be scared, so you need to have that patient rapport. Two, uh, we need to know about any secondary treatments like Derek was talking about. You may not be able to see the entire patient, but if you can at least run your hands down their extremities to see if if they're trapped underneath the dash or by a brake pedal, you know, that's vital information because what we don't want to happen is gain access to the patient, think we're good, and then start to pull them out and think, oh no, we got a secondary entrapment. That can all be worked out while, while uh, things are getting set up. Um, if the steering column or steering wheel can be manipulated easily with a lever, it creates more space, more room. If the seat can be adjusted, move forward, move back, whatever the case may be. Once again, we're creating more room. It may alleviate a lot of work on down uh, in the process. So all those things can be done by that person who's inside the car. If the patient has a seatbelt on, get the seatbelt off. I mean, I don't know how many calls I've been on where, all right, we're ready to take the patient out. Oh, wait, they still have their seatbelt on. Cut that thing. If you have shears, undo it, whatever, the, whatever it might take. Uh, and uh, one of the things very important is patient protection and we'll show you some of the things that we have on our truck for patient protection but we don't want to start doing any of that work any of that cutting without having them protected not only from glass but from our tools as well so we'll show you some hard protection some soft protection and uh, you know because once again you know our ultimate goal is to, to get them out as safe as possible and, and make it safe for ourselves um, so I think that's all I had, really. I do want to do this. Yes. We do have a patient trap inside. Um, so far, we only have one patient. Well, we're going to attack, we're going to go ahead and kind of clean, stabilize the vehicle. 
So again, I'll be talking about in the class, you're in or out of circle, we're looking for hazards. We want to ask you physically walk around the vehicle just like you would do on a fire. You do a hot lap, you're doing a hot lap around this vehicle, do a 360. Second for obviously any hazards in, in the car, under the car, above the car, around the car. Uh, number of locations of patients. Obviously, what we have, uh, you have a, we do have a mannequin inside this vehicle, so we know we have one patient as, as a driver. Uh, again, at that point, we're also going to want to start stabilizing the vehicle. We're going to be walking up with, with our cribbing in our hand, uh, also a tool in our hand. So we're going to go ahead and uh, place our wheel shock. So if you guys want to come over here real quick. For a vehicle on our Ford, which is what we're dealing with here today, we want to have four points of stabilization. Okay, it's going to be mirrored on the opposite side of the vehicle. So, textbook. Thank you, sir. Perfect. We're going to take our step chocks. These step chocks are meant to be used in an upside down fashion, okay, because they create a lot more surface area and you're going to get better contact and support. With the, uh, with the vehicle. You're going to place it basically right underneath the A post. Put it all the way in, okay? Give it a good kick, okay? Make sure it's in there nice and snug. The second one's going to be like, like exactly where it's placed right here, right in front of the rear tire. It's going to be mirrored on the other side of the vehicle, okay? Is that your Just, cribbing your truck? No, it's not the heavy. It's not the heavy. No. Again, just having the cribbing in place does not stabilize the vehicle. We are still sitting on the suspension, okay? In order to get this frame of this vehicle to sit on this cribbing, we're going to actually have to deflate the tires. Again, that's where the, the tool comes in hand. We're just, we're just going to talk about it right now. We're going to have you guys actually go ahead and do it. Uh, I'm going to go up through a little bit more uh, full speed. You're going to take the, the pike end of the halligan, and you're going to strike the tire in the sidewall in the upper half of the tire. The reason we do the upper half of the tire is because if we strike the bottom half of the tire and then the weight of the car, you get, your tool potentially could get stuck actually in the tire. Okay. Controlled swing, you're going to take the bike uh, in the top sidewall of the tire, left it, and then you might have to bend or angle the tool to actually create the opening to allow the air to escape. And then obviously the, the car is going to sit down. You're going to do the same thing with the rear tire. And also while you're here, you're going to go ahead and just take, it, take your glass. Okay. Uh, you can have a center hole punch. You can also use the uh, the pike end of the halligan if you have to. Again, be careful of where your number of locations of patients are. Okay, you don't want to be swinging a halligan if you have a patient sitting right here with their head. Okay, be very very cognizant of that. That being said, if you do have to use the halligan, it's always best to try to come from the from the post side because again, this is going to be your stop. It's going to keep you from going all the way in. You don't want to swing in the middle of the glass. You want to come from the side. Hit the, hit the glass right here, nice and low. The post will keep you from going in too deep into the patient compartment. And it's going to shatter. And you're going to use your glove to clear out the rest of the glass, okay? Get rid of all those sharp edges. And you repeat the same thing with here. Don't forget these little windows. All right. So we got our, we got our cribbing in place. We got our 360 on our hot lap. All right, we're ready to take the tires. You guys ready to take the tires? Good? All right, go ahead. Take the tires. So this could be done from standing outside the vehicle once it's stabilized, or if you have someone inside the car, they could be doing that as well. But we want to protect them while we start breaking all this other glass. Remember, this is a coordinated effort with whoever's running the operation. So until they give you the go-ahead, don't fucking do it, all right? You can let them stand them by to break glass, and then when, when they see that everything's ready to go and the paint is protected, they'll give you the command, all right, go ahead and break glass. And then you can even yell, breaking glass, which announces it to everyone on scene that that's happening. Yeah. This is the glass master. Got this glass master here. This is our rhino tool, okay? Designed for laminate glass, okay? Um, so, what we're going to do is both of these tools need a first point. We're going to start using glass. Okay? So, we're going to take the fork, start going up, up the A-post, okay? Got to go from the first to the last. It doesn't mean that much force. There you go. Alright, 
Alright, so we're going to start with the more difficult tool. You guys can get a real appreciation for this, okay? Alright, everyone get a chance to use the top. So let's go ahead and start here at the top. Just start sawing your way down, okay? Go a few inches and then pass it off to somebody else, okay? Has everyone had a chance to use a rhino? If not, finish it off. Two D eight post. Yeah. All right, that's good. Come at a forty five degree angle, and it won't bind up on you. So down? Yeah, like a diagonal. They all have that task, and they work all simultaneously. That's why it makes it so efficient. Okay. So some of this stuff appeared to be a little bit out of order toward the end, as far as like you know, when we took the battery, and making sure we have someone patient person. The patient person, again, because this is a priority, needs to happen very quickly. So when you're doing that in or out of circle, we want to make sure we gain access to that patient as quickly as possible. To, again, to update commands, to update the hazmat group, all those all those operational uh, decisions that need to be made are going to be based off of the status of what's going on with that patient, okay? Uh, and it's also formulating our plans. So that's going to be one of the first things that happens. So, but again, all these things are going to be happening on simultaneously. So why is someone sitting by? People are still going around, chalking the window, uh, chalking the tires, chalking the vehicle, sticking glass, hood, all these things are going on simultaneously. So now that we've basically taken all, taken care of all those preliminary steps now, we've come to the point where we're now going to have to gain access to this vehicle, okay? okay. And the terminology that we kind of use in extrication is kind of disentanglement, okay? We're, we're, we're removing the vehicle around the patient, okay? Not the patient from the vehicle, okay? Because again, we want to maintain some stability and not move that patient or jostle that patient, hence why we stabilize our vehicle before we do anything. Quick terminology, okay, and again, it's probably reviewed for most of you, if you guys don't know, we have, we say everything, we have our A post, we got our B post, we got our C post. Sometimes SUVs might even have a D post, okay, uh, but that's, we're always starting from front of the vehicle to the back. Uh, when we make our cuts, again, we have our PO, we really want to avoid those seatbelt tensioners and any uh, airbag cylinders, okay? So make sure we're making our cut, we have good visibility about where we're actually making our cut. Strictly for the door, basically we have two options. Okay, we have the come from the inside, come from the lock side. It's either it's a nader bolt or a U bolt here. That's a latching mechanism that holds the door. Okay. Perfect world. If we have our choice. It's better to come from the hinge side because the door and the firewall and everything is a lot is a lot stronger here. Plus, a lot of times when you have uh, an accident, a vehicle accident, most of your patient compartment intrusion is going to be here. So if we're spreading on the depots, we're, we're exacerbating that. We're creating more intrusion. Whereas if we come from the hinge side, we're going against the, the strong A post in the frame and we're pushing out. We're not pushing anything into the patient compartment. Now, that being said, obviously, every situation is different. If you don't, if you don't depending on the damage or vehicles or whatever the scenario is, you may not have access to the, to the A post. So you absolutely can come in and spread the B. You have to, okay? But again, perfect scenario, we have a choice. We're going to try to we're gonna start from the A. Post. All right, that's good. There you go. That's good.
So that's where your communication with the person that has patient contact is vital. You gotta say, hey, listen, we're gonna make our purchase point. We have to do this. They explain it. You know what I mean, then you say, hey, I'm swinging. They they tell them. And it lowers the anxiety. Okay. So again, communication is very important. Now, we're up here where the purchase point is, right? We just want to create an opening so if we need to pop the door, we can get the tip of the, the spreader in there. So, let's get a purchase point on both doors with the hell again. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly, when we have it like that, it's up and down, up and down, right? Up and down. Oh, boy, we'll see
Guys from group A, driver's side, can you guys hear me? I went over this with my group already, so I want to make sure you guys can all hear me because I want to, you know, that's the whole point. All right. So, again, we talked about making purchase points before we get started with our tool, all right? And setting ourselves up for success rather than for failure, right? So, we showed how to do it with, with the Halligan and things like that. Again, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat, a lot of different approaches we can do. One of the other techniques that we're going to show you right now is you take the spreaders. Once the glass is done, just like this, and basically come and open it up wide, drop it down over the door right in the middle, and actually pinch the door. By doing that, you're actually gonna pop the B and the A post forward like this and create a nice opening for both sides, depending on where you need to access from. Again, just another technique you guys can use. So we're gonna demonstrate that now, go ahead. Perfect, go ahead and pinch. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Stay on it, stay on it. Good. Alright, hold it up. Alright, so now you guys can see what I'm talking about. We created a little bit of space here. Obviously, I would get in there still with the Halligan and create a bigger opening, okay? You can see the difference in these tips from the ones that you guys use on the other side that are more tapered. These are very blunt. So it's very important that you get a good purchase point, get a good bite, and work that tool into a position before you go to the, for, the, for the actual spread. Alright. Okay, I'm just the tip of the uh, the door right here. Good. Good enough. Yeah. Good enough. So these are just again, these are just a couple of techniques that you can show you guys to, to approach a door. Depending if you're having tr trouble or you get you get you get jammed up on one approach. You have a couple other opportunities or other choices you have in your tool bag to, to figure it out to problem solve, okay? Alright, so let's go ahead and peel this uh, fender off here. There you go, good. Now stick the tip down in there. Hand up the beer on the top and just pin down here on the bottom. Get here and spread. Alright, so now we can come in here with the cutter. 
ladder, we got this, and we got this latch right here. So you can spread right here. Get this to that. See this attached right here. Man, look at the gap on those, on those spreaders, on those cheers. I mean. That is something that you have to realize when you are cutting near a patient's leg. Because once that thing starts twisting, it takes a lot to get it to go back. So all of a sudden you have someone there with a busted up leg and you're trying to cut something near them and that thing torques on you, that's a bad situation. So that's why we're doing this so you guys can understand what your tool does compared to what our tool does, all right? guys uh, so we finished going over the door we got, we got some uh, you know time on the tools with the spreaders and the cutters I know obviously the driver side got the you guys have to cut around the saws on stuff like that work on some of the a post and B post um, you guys got anything for us anything that you guys saw or experienced or didn't think of before and then you know encountered a problem how'd you work through it anything that was awesome yeah thank you so, I mean, we covered a lot of different techniques. Obviously, we can't cover everything. Like I said, there's a million different ways to skin a cat, but... Um, <laughs> you don't like cats. <laughs> I don't yeah, like cats. I, I, I think, run them over. I think just at, at the end of the day, we want to kind of standardize how we're going to go about um, with this type of uh, an evolution and just understanding that one... Uh, 
no matter where where the extrication may occur, whoever's the first arriving unit, we need that 360 number and location of patients. Uh, need to identify any hazards and you know how how trapped is the patient? What's you know what are what are we going to need? Get that 360 done. Get the vehicle stabilized. Let's make patient contact. Maybe start removing the glass, and then by then, uh, you know, whoever else will, will show up will show up. But we we'll just go ahead and get the ball rolling, and that's, you know, basically what we're going to do. Get the jump line pulled, get the extinguisher ready, and those are just—it's just those things that we're trying to accomplish in those first few minutes that are going to really uh, make the rest of the evolution a lot smoother, and um, it'll be safer too, ultimately. So. Um, it's just a matter of just being on the right page, same page and having good communication with one another and that way whenever one of you guys show up with the the platform or another engine or a rescue or whatever you, you already know what we're doing or and vice versa you know we're all on the same page it's just like responding to a structure fire you know the first arriving unit is going to take command do a 360 secure utilities and find out mm -hmm. if anyone's inside right it's the same thing with extrication it's just you know slightly different tool set so and you're going to see as, as we train more and practice more and again create, create this standard, uh, a lot of these things are going to be happening simultaneously. I mean, everything's going to evolve obviously in a chronological order that makes sense, but uh, we're going to be able to work independent of one another because we're all going to be on the same page. So that's obviously like the goal of what we're striving for. So uh, I want to say thank you for everybody coming out today, man. I really appreciate it. Everyone worked real hard. Hope we had some fun. I know, you know, pretty much most of us, we all really like and enjoy extrication. So this is something that's fun for us to go out here and do. Although I know I obviously it's really hot to spend a lot of time in gear, but I appreciate everyone's help, especially people in my group. Uh, you know, everyone, you know, showing their, their little techniques or their little tips or they, you know, extra set of eyes. You know, we all we all help each other out. So uh, I appreciate y'all and you know, it's a good class. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. 91! <laughs>